Hi, and welcome to 8.5 Hooke's Law. In this lesson, students will be able to describe Hooke's Law, and students will be able to describe and calculate the spring constant of a spring. So, have you ever played with a spring before? Maybe you took apart your clicky pen and you see that little spring in there and you've experienced pushing down on that spring or any other spring for that matter. So here's the scenario. You push on a spring until it's compressed to point A. So really push on the spring. You push on the spring again until it's compressed to point B. You push even more on the spring. Does the spring push back with the same force at points A and B? So in that scenario, with that little spring, all right, you might have pushed on it before, and then it really digs into your fingers. Like, be careful with that, all right? You don't want to dig too much into your fingers with that. But you might have noticed the more you compress the spring, the more force you feel on your fingers. If you just push it a little bit, you're not going to feel that much force. But if you push even more, you feel more force. It's almost like a Newton's third law type of scenario. The more force you exert on the spring, the more the spring exerts a larger force on you. So the idea is that the force changes, the magnitude of the force increases as the distance that you compress or even stretch a spring increases. So yeah, the force changes. How can we possibly deal with this varying force? We're, we're used to just plugging in like 100 Newtons into an equation, and that's what the force is, right? So what do we plug in if it goes from zero to 100 Newtons, <clears throat> right? So what, what do we do? How can we possibly deal with it? Well, luckily, this guy, Robert Hooke, all right, famed inventor, uh, he came up with a solution to this called Hooke's Law, all right? And this is actually uh, a close depiction of him. There's actually no surviving uh, paintings or representation of Robert Hooke. There is a, a myth out there that because of his rivalry with Isaac Newton, uh, Newton had all of the paintings of him destroyed that's that's like the the rumor out there that they had such a heated rivalry that newton wanted to erase him from the annals of history but uh some people say that's not really true but the point is we don't actually have a, a painting of him but there are descriptions of what he looks like but the more important thing is not what you look like but what you did so he invented a lot of cool stuff as you can see including hook's law which states that the force needed to extend or compress a spring by some distance is proportional to that distance. So the force is proportional to the distance. So think about what the equation might look like with a force and a distance. Ha, you might have thought that there's a D in the formula, but there's not. Just like in the previous lesson, the distance for the gravitational field strength, we were like, oh, we should use distance. Actually, we used height and we changed the variable from D to H for height. Well, we're gonna change the variable for distance again. So Fs is the force exerted on the spring. K is something called the spring constant and its units are in newtons per meter. The next slide describes what the spring constant is a little bit more. But back to what we were talking about, x is actually what we use for the distance. And it's either the distance a spring is extended, so you could stretch out a spring. Think of like a, slink, a slinky, you're stretching out that slinky a certain distance, or you compress it. Uh, so again, with that ballpoint pen, uh, little spring, you could push down on that spring from an equilibrium position. So when you're not exerting a force on the spring at all, it's a certain length. And then the distance that you compress it or stretch it, stretch it from that equilibrium point is called X. And that's why we use X is because it, it goes in both direction, uh, extension and compression, stretch and compress. All right, so let's talk about K, K the spring constant. The spring constant, and we use a lowercase k, tells you how stiff a spring is. The higher the spring constant, 
the stiffer the spring is. So these are two examples of springs. There's a slinky and there's uh, like a shock for a car. This spring right here, this uh, black one. All right, so which one would have a higher spring constant? Does the slinky have a higher spring constant or does this shock have a higher spring constant? This one has a higher spring constant because it is stiffer. Not all springs are created equally. So when you're talking about the force that you exert on the spring and how much it's going to stretch or compress the spring, well, yeah, you could exert the same force on both of these springs and it'll stretch or compress a different amount because they're different stiffnesses, right? So the question is now to shift gears a little bit, it says, how is K similar to mu? Do you remember what this is? <clears throat> this is uh, the Greek letter mu. It, it, we use it to represent the coefficient of friction. So <clears throat> we used mu to give us a number that described the roughness between two surfaces. And, and mu was equal to the force of friction between two surfaces divided by the normal force. And you would get some number that represents the roughness between a surface, right? So you wouldn't expect, oh, how rough is that thing? And then you can assign a number to it. That's really useful when you're calculating things. So K, very similarly, is a number that tells us how stiff an object is. So again, you wouldn't expect to be able to uh, assign a, a number value to the stiffness of a spring, but you can. And the way we do that is we take the force that the spring is exerting and divide it by the distance that it's stretched or compressed. This is just a manipulated Hooke's law. Uh, and yeah, so both of these numbers kind of tell us, they assign a number to a real world scenario, either the roughness between two surfaces or the stiffness of a spring. And that allows us to do some fun calculations and predict what will happen um, in different scenarios. So let's talk about elongation or compression, which is the letter X that we use. It says the elongation compression of a spring is always measured from the equilibrium position. So here's a diagram. There's going to be two more diagrams after this. So let's say if the spring is five meters long here, so this is five meters. That's a long spring, five meters, that's a super long spring, and is stretched to 5.2 meters. I guess I should have made this centimeters, uh, but that's, I mean, listen, in theory, you could have a spring that long for sure. So now it is 5.2 meters. That's a very long string. What is X? All right, so from this equilibrium position right here, if you're not exerting a force on the spring, this is how long the spring is. All right, and you probably already know, right? So what is the, what is X? What is that distance from the equilibrium position? All right, it's gonna be 5.2 minus 5.0, and you get uh, X is equal to 0 0.2 meters. So this is a way that they can word the question uh, they'll tell you like, oh, it's five meters and then it's stretched to 5.2 meters. Use Hooke's law to calculate the force and you'll be OK. You're, you're writing your guess method. X is equal to what? And then you'll see these two numbers in the problem and you're like, oh, is it five or is it 5.2? Actually, it's neither. The distance that you're stretched is 0 0.2 meters. So it's the difference between those two. Sometimes they'll just straight out tell you, okay, it's stretched a distance of 0 0.2 meters and then you're good to go. You could plug that in. But again, this is just a way they can kind of word the problem to make you do a little extra work. Um, you won't see this value in the word problem itself. Um, so you can't just plug in the numbers like we normally do. So if X is the same value in C, how long is the spring now? Again, a different, uh, a tricky way you could do it. So this is still gonna be five meters to the equilibrium position. All right, try to figure this out, pause the video. All right, so if X is the same value, it's 0 0.2 meters, what is this distance? How, how long is the spring now? 
All right, so you would do 5 minus 0.2, and you get 4.8 meters. I'm really just trying to make sure you have a grasp of, like, what actually is X. Uh, it's the distance from equilibrium, and then don't uh, sleep on the fact that you can be given these values instead, the length of the spring itself. Okay. So where is Hooke's Law? Do you have to memorize it? No, you do not. All right, it is on the back. Do you see it? Let's see, I'm looking for it. Mm. Oh, okay, cool, it's right here. Fs is equal to Kx, all right? And Fs is located, look at all these different forces. Wow, that they give you. All right, this is the force on the spring. So anytime you see a spring in the word problem, you're probably going to use either this one or the very next one is the potential energy in a spring or the elastic potential energy formula. And you can see K and X pop up in those as well. So if you see the word spring in the word problem, you'll probably have to use one of those two equations. Probably. I mean, you might have to do some kind of manipulation of the conservation of energy, but more than likely... More likely than not, you'll have to use one of those two if you see the word spring. Okay, so some graph analysis. It says, what is the relationship between the force exerted on the spring and the elongation of the spring? Pause the video. What do you think this graph is going to look like? And how would you describe that relationship? Okay, hopefully you could see from this equation that it is a direct relationship. If you double the distance that you stretch or compress it, you're going to double the force that the spring is exerting. Okay, here's the critical thinking question. What does the slope of an FS versus X curve represent? What does the slope tell us if we were going to calculate it? Pause the video and think about it. Okay, so very similar to like the kinematic equation or that when we did kinematics, we analyzed these slopes and even, well, yeah, for power, I think we did one. So it's the rise over the run. So what are the Y values, the force, and what are the X values? Ooh, in this case, the X value in this graph, the X axis um, is X, the stretch or compress, right? We use X for that. So, and then what is FS versus uh, Fs divided by x, it's equal to k. If you divide x in this equation, divide both sides by x, you get k. All right, so that means that the slope is equal to the spring constant. And the what happens if, well, I guess the next slide tells you that. So the slope is equal to the spring constant. So which spring has the lowest spring constant? And which spring is the stiffest? Is it the green, the blue, or the red? Pause the video and answer those two questions. All right, so the higher the slope, or the steeper the slope, I should say, the stiffer the spring is, the larger the slope, right? And then as you go down, you're getting closer to a slope of zero, and that would give you a low spring constant and that means it's not a very stiff spring. So as you get closer down, you're getting closer to like a slinky. All right. So this is the lowest spring constant, and this would be the stiffest spring. Two different ways to ask the same question. It's just really asking, uh, do you understand that the slope is equal to the spring constant? All right, so two examples. Example number one, a spring has a spring constant of 30 newtons per meter. What is the minimum force required to compress the spring 0.5 meters from its equilibrium position? Okay, so pause the video and try it out. So when you're doing your guess method, all right, keep an eye out for this terminology, newtons per meter. So if you're just breezing over the question, you might see, oh, 30 newtons. Uh, maybe that's equal to the force. No, now we have this new thing called a Newton per meter. So, and it tells you this is the spring constant. So this is some new terminology for you. Remember the spring constant is equal to K. Oh, and I didn't point it out on the reference table, but on, on the right-hand side there, uh, 
I'm sure that K is there and it says spring constant. So if, if you see this in the problem, you're like, ooh, what was that again? Just look on the right-hand side for the word spring constant and then it'll say, oh, that's equal to K. Okay, so this is 30 newtons per meter. What is the minimum force required to stretch or compress at 0 0.5 meters from equilibrium? So you're looking for the force. So Fs is equal to Kx. Fs is equal to 30 times 0 0.5. And we could do, watch this, newtons per meter. You don't have to write it in, but I'll show you this. 0 0.5 meters. All right, and a meter times a meter, uh, oh, sorry, a meter divided by a meter cancels out, and you're left with newtons. So 30 times 0.5 is 15 newtons. So it takes 15 newtons to compress this spring this distance, okay? Just as a side note, if you had this spring stretching here with like a block, all right, actually let's do it sideways just so that we don't have to account for gravity. Just if, it, if the only force is your applied force, all right, then you're gonna stretch out this spring a certain distance from where the equilibrium was, all right? And this applied force is equal to Fs. This is really the force that the spring is exerting back on you. It, it wants to go back towards equilibrium. The direction of the force on the spring is technically always back towards equilibrium. It's trying to get back to that point where it was at rest. Um, so there's different ways to word it. They might say like, oh, what is the applied force? You could still just use Fs equals Kx. And then if you tell me, oh, the spring force is 15, it's assumed that uh, that's also what the applied force is, okay? In this class, we're not gonna get too crazy into uh, additional forces on the free body diagram. If it is a vertical spring, uh, it's typically just gonna be like, let's say this is the mass. There is a Hooke's Law experiment that's like this. So it, originally it was like this with, this with no mass attached to the spring. And then you put a mass, like a hanging mass on the spring and you measure how much was it stretched out. All right. Similarly, this applied force is really just the, the weight. All right, we're not going to be okay. So you, we're not going to put this mass on here and then come over and pull on it with another applied force. Technically, you could do that, and then the spring force would be a combination of these two together. You'd have to do like a net force equation, but we don't really do any of that in this class. Uh, it's really just uh, either you're pulling on the spring or you're doing this classic experiment where it's the weight of the hanging masses that's causing it. But it's really just always just one force uh, that's a, uh, kind of opposing the spring force, which is why you could always just pretty much just use this formula and you don't have to do a crazy net force equation, which is nice, but it's good to know that, you know, that's really what's happening. Okay, one more example. It says an unstretched spring has a length of 0.2 meters when the spring is stretched by a force of 10 newtons, its length increases to 0.25 meters. What is the spring constant of this spring? So this is a little bit tricky now. Pause the video and see if you can do it. So you probably already know where this is going, but I will draw a diagram. This will be like before and after. So before you stretch the spring, it's just hanging out in equilibrium. There's no force on it. And the distance is, or sorry, I shouldn't even say the distance. The length of the spring is 0 0.2 meters. Then somebody comes along and exerts a force on it, stretches it out. How many? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I made it another loop. One, two, three, four. Okay, so it's stretched out by some kind of force here. 
And they tell you the force is equal to 10 newtons. And remember, like that's really, this is the applied force. Technically, we also say the spring force is that, and that allows us to use Hooke's law equation. Um, but for the sake of like clarity of this diagram, I'll just leave that out for now. The length of the spring, I'll draw this down here. The length of the spring is now 0 0.25 meters, okay? And it says, what is the spring constant of the spring? Well, you might be tempted to go straight into your guess method and say, okay, the force is 10 Newtons. And then we know we're looking for the spring constant. So that's something tricky is like, oh, they're looking for this. What the heck is that? Oh yeah, it's K. So that's what I'm looking for. Uh, we need to know what X is. So is X 0.2 or is it 0.25? Hopefully you see, oh yeah, it's that thing that you mentioned before. It's actually neither of those. We're looking for the difference between those two numbers. It was stretched by how much you do 0 0.25 minus 0 0.2 and you get 0 0.05 meters that's how much it was stretched out by so x is equal to 0 0.05 the difference in those two numbers and as i stated in the previous uh, example when you're doing that lab in class with the hanging mass uh, that's kind of what you have to do you measure the spring initially and then you measure the spring when you put the hanging mass on it and then you have to do the subtraction to find how much it was stretched stretched by so that's really the only way they could make it a little bit trickier so we have f s is equal to k x uh, if you wanted to you could solve for k first since we're looking for the spring constant and really this is the definition of the spring constant it's a ratio of the force exerted on the spring and how much that force will stretch it out. So if it's uh, a high force, and if it's a high force and it doesn't stretch it out that much, you're exerting a big force, but it doesn't really have an effect on it. That means you have a high spring constant and it's a stiff spring because you're exerting a greater force and it doesn't really stretch it out that much. So this is like the definition of the spring constant. Um, so the K is equal to 10 Newtons divided by 0 0.05 meters. And by the way, this is where the unit comes from, a Newton per meter for the spring constant. And when you do that, you get a spring constant of 200 Newtons per meter. That's a pretty typical spring constant because you could give uh, 10 Newtons of force and then it'll only stretch it out five centimeters. Uh, so that's that's pretty typical, but springs vary. Um, all right, so anyway, uh, now that we know how to deal with the force on a spring and how it changes, you know, like that's that's kind of a big deal. We have to address how the force changes depending on what the distance it's stretched is. In the next lesson, we're going to go back to saying, okay, W is equal to FD, right? So the work I do in stretching the spring should be equal to the energy stored in the spring. I'm doing work on it. I exert a force over a distance. So I'm doing work on the spring. That work is stored in energy in the spring. If I let go of the spring, then it's going to jump back. And that stored elastic potential energy gets transferred into kinetic energy because it moves around, right? It's moving. So now that we know this for springs specifically, in the next lesson, we're gonna see how that ties into W is equal to FD, all right? It's kind of interesting. And that's where we get the elastic potential energy formula. Anyway, that's about it. Thanks for watching and have a great day.